I mean Chicago. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Sabu Ahmed from JPEX. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. So this is the greeting that we Muslims greet each other when we meet each other. So I was requested by the committee that I should be uh, sharing Islam and uh, about Ramadan in the comparative religion format. So you may be surprised to find out the greeting that I just greeted, that was exactly the similar greeting that Jesus, he greeted to his disciples when he met them at the, at the upper chamber. It says in the Gospel of John chapter 20 verse number 19, when he met his disciples, the very first thing that he mentioned to them was peace be upon you. So we Muslims, we say we are following Jesus, Moses, Abraham, David, uh, Ishmael and Isaac, all the prophets which are also there in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, peace be upon all of them. So you may be surprised to find out that uh, the interfaith iftar that we are having, this is not the very first time that Muslims are having this. Do any one of you know who may have been the very first president who initiated interfaith iftar or iftar with the Muslims in the White House? Anyone knows that answer? Without Googling, by the way, right? <laughs> Take a guess. Is it President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, President Trump, right? <laughs> no, not that one. You guys know it, come on. How about in the 1800s? How about the early 1800s? Who was in 1809, who was the president? Madison, Monroe? <laughs> no, there's no teacher over here. How about Jefferson? All right, come on, you knew that. Yeah, so that was the very first time in the White House itself, there was an iftar or the fast breaking meal with the Muslim delegation along with the president. So you may be, you know, I was speaking with uh, Dan and Kathy over there, welcome, you know, all of you are welcome by the way. And they were explaining to me that they were also fasting, right, to some degree for Lent. So two weeks ago, we, there was an interfaith gathering and next to me was a pastor. So when he found out that I was fasting, he said, you know, Sabil, I am also fasting. So then I asked him the question, that, you know, I am fasting for the last 14 hours. When was the last time you ate? And he said, uh, I just had my lunch, right? <laughs> and I was thinking, what kind of fasting is that, right? <laughs> I do respect that, you know, Christians, our friends, are fasting from uh, something, some idea, maybe some uh, food, right? So which is, okay, which is fasting? But we say we are fasting the way that Jesus and Moses and Abraham, the way that they used to fast, we are fasting exactly the same way because it's total absentee from any food, any water, any drink, 100%, not a single drop of water. So if you would like to know, those who are familiar or not familiar with fasting, there are two or three reasons why we are fasting. First reason is, so this is in chapter two of the Quran, verse number 183. So the translation is this, God is addressing to the Muslims and God is saying that all you who believe, Fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you that you may attain, you know, uh, God consciousness, self-discipline, closeness to the Creator. So the very first reason we are fasting because it is one of the five pillars of Islam. So I know that uh, Kathy, you have taken some classes in Islam long time ago. So this question is for you, right? Can you name the other four pillars of Islam? <laughs> name at least one, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Shaquille can help you out, okay. Shaquille, go ahead, help, give, give her one. To go to pilgrimage, right? So fine, that's one of the pillars of Islam. Muslims go for pilgrimage at least once in our lifetime. And you were raising your hand, young man up there, yes. Zakat? Yeah, mashallah, zakat, right? Alhamdulillah, which is to pay a certain portion of our saved assets uh, to the poor, the needy, and the less fortunate, right? So let's go with uh, two more pillars we are left with. What do we do? What did we just do upstairs in the big praying area? Daily prayers. The daily prayers, right? Five times a day. 
And the very first pillar is to recite uh, the testimony of faith that we recite many times a day that I bear witness there is no other God besides one God, Allah, and I bear witness Muhammad is the messenger. So that is the very first reason that we fast because this is one of the pillars of Islam, fasting. The second reason we are also fasting is because we are also, we want to also follow the example of the previous prophets and the previous messengers because the second aspect of this word says that fasting was also given to the previous messengers and prophets. So those who are from the Christian and the Jewish background, you'll be amazed to also find out that in the Old Testament, there's a lot of you know, uh, uh, verses about fasting. So in fact, when the Ten Commandments were given to Moses, peace be upon him, he was in the state of fasting. It says in the book of Exodus chapter 34, verse number 28, that Moses, he refrained from any bread, any food, any water, any drink for 40 days and 40 nights. And then God wrote on the tablets the Ten Commandments. And when you look into a prophet Jesus, who we consider as a mighty prophet, he was also fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. It says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter uh, 4, verse number 2. So not just fasting, by the way, we Muslims, we say, we also want to follow the rituals and the message of all the messengers and all the prophets. So in fact, uh, not just fasting, the way that we Muslims pray. So how many of you have seen Muslims pray, those who are not from the Islamic faith? Right, many of you may have seen Muslims pray. So one of the positions in prayer is that we prostrate. We prostrate to God, no mediator directly, we, we pray to God. So uh, Abraham, peace be upon him. It mentions in the, in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse number 3, when some good news, some happy news was given to him, he prostrated himself on the ground and he was worshipping the one creator. Exactly the same thing is mentioned about Prophet Moses and Prophet Aaron. When they went to the place of prayer, they prostrated themselves and they, and they prayed to God. It says in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verse number 6, and Jesus, who we consider as a messenger of God, he was praying exactly the same way to God. It says in Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39. When people were coming after him, he went to the garden of Gethsemane over there. He prayed to God, saying that, Oh God, take this cup of death away from me, not my will, but your will. So we say we are also uh, fasting and praying and following the message of absolute monotheism that all the prophets and all the messengers that they brought to their people. The, the higher and the greater uh, you know, dimension of fasting would be this. You know, if I ask the Muslims over here who have been fasting for the last uh, like 14 hours, right? So what time is, uh, are we going to break the fast today? <laughs> what time? <laughs> How many seconds? <laughs> you know, if you ask my third grader, Yusuf, what, what, time are, what, day, what time are we going to break the fast today? He knows exactly by the second almost, right? <laughs> and he's fasting, by the way, third grader, right? Uh, the, the whole, uh, uh, all the days so far. So, the higher and the greater dimension of fasting is this. I would say it is easier to stay away from food and water and drink but fasting is also staying away from all the wrong things we're not supposed to be doing. Like lying and backbiting and fighting and you know cheating and uh, blasphemy, um, going over the speed limit sometimes, right? <laughs> all the wrong things we're not supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be fasting from all of those things. We are, we are supposed to be conscious to such a degree that we should keep them out for the rest of our lives. But fasting, according to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who is a role model for humanity, we say that we should be inculcating all the good things we should be doing, like respecting parents, being good to neighbors, right? Uh, gaining good education, helping humanity, the poor, the needy, the homeless, all the good things we are supposed to be doing, we should be more conscious of doing this in this 29 to 30 days to such a degree that they should become part of our life for the rest of the lives. So that is the bigger, higher dimension of fasting. I'm not sure how many of you have fasted our guests from other faiths. When you're fasting for you know, 14 hours, uh, last year maybe it was 15 hours, right? <laughs> last year before that maybe 16 hours. When you fast for this long, you can actually feel how a poor person feels or a hungry person feels. Because if you are eating 
and all day, we may be imagining how a hungry person may be feeling, but unless and until we are fasting and going through the hunger, that's, then, that's when we can place ourselves in the shoes of a hungry person. There are millions of fellow Americans, millions of people around the world who are hungry, they go to sleep hungry. So once we are fasting, we can actually feel how they are feeling, so that will help us to reach out in our pockets, our purses, our banks, so we can be more charitable. So at the end of the day, I would say that fasting is a 30-day boot camp, right? Once a person goes through this intense training and the discipline and all the requirements and the guidance, once we come out of this boot camp, we are supposed to transform ourselves to be a better family member, a better husband, better wife, better parent, better child, right? A better neighbor, better human, and the most of all, a better worshiper of the Creator. So we hope and pray that through the guidance of God and through this immense institution of fasting, that we can bring humanity together. We can feel for the people who are less fortunate. We can reach out more to them. And I hope and pray that by God's guidance, which was recited, by the way, really beautifully by our young uh, you know, reciter, an excellent translation, by the way. Very good, good translation. So let me just readdress that same translation uh, and then close off, right? So the passage is from chapter 49 of the Quran, verse number 13. Chapter 49, verse number 13 in the Quran, God is addressing to all of humanity and God is saying that, O oh mankind, O oh humanity, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into people and nations and tribes that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and despite and discriminate with each other, you get to know each other. Then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered, pious and God-fearing person. So we hope and pray that with God's guidance by us being good humans and being part of the wonderful family, that may God bring justice and unity and morality and peace and loving peace to all of humanity. Amen. May God guide and bless us all. Thank you very much.